now it's austere environment. You're going to be treating this person on your own. There's no evac coming. There's no dust off to uh, take care of you. You're on your own with this person. And by the way, you're the transport. Not only are you treating this person, but you're trying to get them from point A to point B where you can get them into the pre-hospital care system. And so that was very intense for me because you are, it's one of the few volunteer areas where you are in charge of a life. You save a life. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Chris Boyer. Chris is the executive director for the National Association for Search and Rescue and has extensive experience both domestically and internationally across a long career spanning law enforcement, search and rescue, and technology. He's a graduate of the Office of Emergency Services Search Management class back in 1996 and the National Search and Rescue School in 2000. He served in the Contra Costa operational area as the County Emergency Services Manager and then as the Vice President of Operations for Kenyan International, where he was in charge of a number of international search and rescue operations. Both the depth of his experience and his absolute joy for search and rescue is immediately obvious in this conversation. We talk about what defines the search and rescue mindset, what it takes to rapidly move from zero notice to full-scale operations, the discipline of patience, and really what it takes to move through a high-threat environment, and honestly, just a ton more. Now, before we get started, if you're new to the podcast and new to the Emergency Mind Project in general, welcome to the community. You might want to check out our book, The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. You can find that at emergencymind.com book. If you've been here before, welcome back. We are psyched that you're here. Now, as always, if you have ideas that you want us to cover, things for how to improve, or anything else related to the podcast or to the Emergency Mind Project in general, you can reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. And you can find us at podcast at emergencymind.com. Okay, all that said, let's jump into this awesome episode. I hope you enjoy. All right, Chris, welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you for coming on board. I am psyched to talk to you. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And I'm pretty psyched to be here as well. So for folks that don't know you and maybe aren't familiar with your world, can you give everybody a quick breakdown of who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I'm uh, Chris Boyer, and I'm the executive director for the National Association for Search and Rescue, otherwise known as NASAR. And I manage the day-to-day operations at the direction of our board of directors. And we provide education, certification, and publishing for search and rescue uh, responders. How'd you get into search and rescue at the beginning? Like what's like back in time, Chris, look like? Yeah. So back in time, I got out of the Marine Corps after 10 years and I spent a couple of years working in the civilian world and I still wanted to be a steward in my community. I wanted to give back some way. And as a rock climber, I happened to watch a a couple of uh, rescues. And like any of us that are out there, I had my opinions on, on what was being done right and wrong. And I thought, you know, maybe maybe this is something I could get into. I was in California at the time, and search and rescue in California is legislated to the county sheriff. So I contacted the county sheriff, and I applied, and it took a couple of months. But next thing I know, uh, a couple of years later, I'm in charge of the search and rescue team for the sheriff and became the emergency manager for that county. Had you had search and rescue training before that? Was that part of like your training coming up? No, not really. You know, uh, my training before that had been mostly outdoors training, Boy Scouts and then the Marines, but nothing wrapped around how to affect a search grid or a search mission or what kind of Bayesian statistics are used or lost person behavior statistics are used. I had none of that. It was all a total enlightenment to me. What was that training like? The first part was not too intense. Obviously, (laughs) I I knew map and compass and that sort of thing. But then we got into the wilderness first aid, which was a little more intense for me. It's it's different than combat aid, you know, buddy care, self-care, buddy care. Mm -hmm. Um, Now it's austere environment. You're going to be treating this person on your own. There's no evac coming. There's there's no dust off to uh, take care of you. You're on your own with this person. And by the way, you're the transport. You know, not only are you treating this person, but you're trying to get them from point A to point B where you can get them into the pre-hospital care system. And so that was very intense for me. It's one of the few volunteer areas where you are in charge of a life, that you you save a life. You know, firemen, mostly paid. Cops, mostly paid. Lawyers, mostly paid. You know, all these other positions, all paid professions. Hmm. And here we are, volunteer professionals in the search and rescue world. 
I love this subtle. Oh, the first part wasn't too hard. That's always a good sign that, that what's coming next <laughs> yeah. is, you know, going to hit you like a punch in the face. But that's that's really interesting. So one of the things we talk about a lot in the Emergency Mind Project is sort of this sort of two gap idea, right? The idea that the distance between where we start and the more expert product that we want to be is really crossing two gaps. There's a skills gap and an application of skills gap, right? We have to learn the skills and knowledge, and then we have to also learn how to apply those skills and knowledge under pressure. Was there a similar framework that was used for you in that? Because you're describing both technical challenges and mental challenges as you're going through all of this. Yeah. So the you're taught the conceptual parts of this is how you do map and compass work. You're getting from point A to point B, and you're in a classroom environment, so to speak. And so there is not the pressure. You're just moving. You want to try to take the path of least resistance while you do it, but also, you know, the path of least risk, et cetera. It goes from that sort of thing. All of a sudden now you're in a you're in your first mock search, your first training where they're pretending there's somebody that's injured, and you jump into now let's use this in the environment. And now it changes quite a bit because now I'm not allowed to make decisions on my own time frame. Mm-hmm. Now somebody's life is in your hands and you have to make that decision a lot faster. And even though you're being pushed to make it faster, the impact, the consequences are that much more dramatic and can be hurtful. And, you know, we don't want to do, you know, first do no harm, right? Mm-hmm. So I have lots of opportunity to do harm as a search and rescue professional volunteer when I am trying to apply my skills plus other things like the mechanics of a GPS or an over the snow vehicle um, or anything else that were kind of a secondary skill set that we might have to use in getting this person from point A to point B and into the pre-hospital care system. What was that like for you the first few times you did that? Because I mean, you're this, this story is taking place after you spent 10 years in the Marine Corps. So you're certainly right. no stranger to stress, pressure, high impact training, and and complex adaptive problem sets. Right? right. So so you had some of that, you know, sort of software already on board. But what was that like the first few times that you tried to apply this kind of stuff in those real moral circumstances? Yeah, a completely new environment. You have to be very self-motivated. There's no one there pushing you. And in the military, you signed up, you kind of know what you signed up for. Things get things get difficult, but there's a certain amount of structure there that keeps you on pace and on course. In search and rescue, there isn't. Uh, it's, you're a lot of volunteers from different backgrounds. You have other jobs. When you're in the Marines, your job is being a Marine. But when you're in search and rescue, your 95% job is doing other stuff, whether you're a butcher or a lawyer or um, a taxi driver or whatever you are in that melting pot, that's 95% of your life. So you have to really switch on that game face and switch that brain mode from, okay, I'm going from being an Uber driver now to I've got to do my soap notes correctly. I've got to look at this person. I've got to assess them appropriately. And by the way, you know, we're we're hanging a couple hundred feet off the deck and I need to be looking at belays. I need to be thinking about proper signals for hauling. I need to be making sure that the guys at the top, I trust to do edge protection and to make sure that they've got all the right brakes in place so we don't go sliding and flopping. And then we have to do it quick because this person's in pain or suffering, or I just need to make them as salvageable as possible when we get into the top. So yeah, it's a very different environment. The sphincter quality is different. It really is. <laughs> that's great. That's a good That's a good way to put that. Yeah, because so I, I got to tell you that in the Marine Corps, when you go out on a mission, you know, what are the odds that you're going to meet up with somebody? What are the odds that your patrol is going to make contact? But in search and rescue, when you go out, you know there's someone missing. You know that you're going to get to them and you know you're going to have to treat them and and take care of them. So it's a very, very positive outcome from a an operational point of view that you're going to, you know, end up having to fulfill this process. And hopefully it'll be a, a positive outcome on the back end as well. You're describing a really high level of cognitive load that you're under when you're doing this kind of an operation. And and it's got 
you know, explosive moments of load, like you're you're hanging above a whatever, trying to get somebody out of a whatever, technical terms. Uh, right. And then you're also describing a high amount of allostatic load, which is that from the moment you're off, you know, you're also keeping yourself safe out in the wilderness and trying to find those paths of least risk and resistance. How do you manage that cognitive load as as an operator in those circumstances? Yeah. So um, focus. We teach a lot of monomics, you know, like soap notes and things like that. Um, we focus on what we call last, locate, access, stabilize, transport. And you try to go back to those basics at, at each time. We use a lot of checklists. Obviously, that's easier, especially for new people and old people. Pilots have, have figured that out for a long time. New pilots and old pilots, they use the same checklist and it works. And so that's what we do as well. And then standardization goes a long way because you may be working with people you've never met before. Sure. Um, and so a standardized set of response protocols or safety measures all go towards helping uh, keep you focused. But there's just like pilots get uh, target fixation and they end up flying into the ground. You know, we get very, very fixated on that subject. And we have to be very careful about that, about not making, again, bad decisions. And so that's why under the incident command system, we always have a safety officer there to help keep us from from doing high risk things. You know, the path of least resistance may be the path of most risk, which is, for example, a helicopter. But if the weather's minimal and this is a broken ankle or, or a knocked up knee or even a dislocated hip, why do we need to take that helicopter if it's only a two hour hike out to the trailhead to the waiting ambulance? And even at when you look at that, it's only an hour because we'll be hiking out an hour. And I am sure that the EMTs and paramedics will be trying to push that uh, that stretcher in and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. And so that person will start getting that advanced care well before we hit the trailhead and get them into the ambulance. So, and a lot of that equipment now is so portable, 16 leads and things like that, people that you can take on. Some of the, the pararescue groups in the military now, they have ATVs with oxygen generators on them and 16, all all that stuff is right on that one ATV and they can put that subject in the Stokes litter and, and get them somewhere pretty quick. Yeah. So we're starting to, we're starting to paint a picture of the different levels of operation that we're talking about, right? We're talking about the individual operator and what goes into the search and rescue mindset from that perspective. We're also talking a little bit about the structure and the teamwork level of organization, right? We're already talking about incident command systems and how to push the edge of where you're able to receive a person, which is more of a system sort of, of style. Um, let's drive through that. Focusing just for a moment still on the internal aspect, like the individual level of stuff and the search and rescue operator mindset. You said two things that really struck me. One is that you're working with folks that spend 95% of their time with a different brain operating, and then 5% of the time in this other space, this, this what we would call out of the Mission Critical Team Institute, the extraordinary world of one, one sense or another, which is a very different mindset than what happens for folks that are deployed for multiple months in a high threat environment, right? And which seems to be quite a bit different even from what you were describing about your time in the Marines. And then the other aspect of it that really strikes me is this idea that you're expecting contact every time you're out, right? That's very different even from us in the ER. Like I'm always expecting patients in the ER. Never had a single right. shift where there wasn't a patient. I, I <laughs> never even heard of a shift like that. But I've certainly no. had whole shifts where there's never been a truly critical moment, right? There right. hasn't been a code. There hasn't been a you know, serious trauma. There hasn't been a complicated airway. So you can spend your time with medium levels of stuff without really hitting that high contact stuff. Both of those two aspects that you're describing seem very different. What else do you think defines the search and rescue mindset? And or feel free to jump into any of those you know buckets mm -hmm. I put out there. Yeah, like like you said, at an ER, that's not a zero onset issue. The start of your shift is the beginning. Driving in, you already know what it's going to be like. You've done this shift a thousand times before. It's a full moon. There's no moon. It's whatever it's out full there, moon, right? Man. Yeah, it's always a full moon. And for search and rescue, that's not it. You're minding your own damn business and your, mm -hmm. your phone or your pager goes off and it's zero onset. You at that point have mere minutes to switch gears from whatever I was doing then, which is my life, to now I have to do this highly critical life saving maneuver. 
And so you get into the gear of, of preparation. You always have your gear ready. You, the last thing you want to be doing is looking for your stuff. One of my friends said that when he and his wife had their first baby, that, you know, they went through Lamaze and everything. And the first time she had a contraction, he ran around for 20 minutes with their bag and had a deck of cards in it. And that's what they went to the hospital with was a deck of cards. You know, you got to have that stuff prepped. You got to yeah. be ready, be mission ready. And you can't have your summer pack in January. You got to have your heavier clothing, your extra layers, your extra calories, all that in it already. You've got to be prepared. So the very first part of that is always being prepared because that takes that first 10 minutes of time that lets you ramp up into, okay, now where am I going? Have I been there before? I'm pretty sure I have the skill set to do whatever we're being asked. I know my gear's ready and I practiced my nav before and we've worked at this park before. So all those things begin to now help you as, as you are ramping up, begin to help, I want to say, cut off the, the peak of that. You know, mm -hmm. I got my gear. Okay. Now I've been here before. Okay. So you start cutting the peaks off of those, those ramp ups to something that's manageable. And as you do that, you build confidence in yourself. I got my pack. I know that if anything happens to me out there and I get lost or I get hurt, I can take care of myself. I can be out there for 24 hours before I really need assistance. And so I don't become the problem. I am still part of the solution. My skill set, again, I don't want to become part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. Am I ready for this? And this is the beginning part of the question that you have to ask yourself of, is this the right mission for me? And you have to start doing your own risk assessment, right? Have I been there before? Have I got all the right training? Am I feeling good today? Or am I just, I'm scattered because of work today. This is probably not the mission for me versus the drive. I've been training for years and it's our first mission. And now I want to go. I've got to balance that. And that's a very difficult thing for professionals to do. And as well for cops and for doctors and for firemen as well. There's that drive to that mission because of the adrenaline rush, because of the commitment to that, that victim or a subject, missing subject, it's it's a, it's a hard thing. Yeah. And I would certainly add because of your commitment to your teammates as well, right? That's the thing that drives yep. all of us that, you know, we all, you know, we all have that idea that there's no passengers, there's only crew here, right? Yes. Like we're all in this together to try to make a difference. Yep. Um, you know, I, I think if you're somebody that has had one of these, uh, as you call it, sort of like a zero onset moments where you're minding your own business and then something goes left, right? Whether that's search and rescue or in the, in the ER, we think about that as like, you know, it was, somebody gets dropped off and they're in cardiac arrest unexpectedly mm -hmm. or uh, mass casualty. Uh, right. Mass you always casualty. expect the onesies. You never expect mm -hmm. the, oh my gosh, school bus 27, yeah, yeah. you know, and now you're the level two trauma instead of the level one. And now you're getting six of these kids. Holy crap. Right. Or you, you get you called know? upstairs yeah. to run a code in a different part of the hospital or something yeah. like that. Right. Yep. And so one of the things that strikes me from all of the times that I've done that is that it always feels like my body arrives in a space before my brain quite gets there. You physically start the process and then you sort of catch up to what you're doing. And what you're describing about making that first part of what you do, drilling it so that it becomes automatic is mm -hmm. really the antidote to that because you want those first motions to be so smooth and so polished that you have a chance to sp like spin your cycles back up. You know, we talk about the Yerkes Dodson curve of performance. You got to really ramp yourself up to that optimal zone of performance. But whatever it is or model you're using to describe it that you're that you're making the first part automatic. It's not that you don't have to be a, everything that you're doing, but so that you can allow yourself the space and time to, you know, start yeah. the engines and fire everything up. It's got to be autonomic, I think is the mm -hmm. right word. Um, the muscle memory of your mind and, like you said, your body, you need to give your mind time to catch up. And so you need to have it drilled. So while your mind is looking at that threat as a cop, my hand and my arm have to be on their own pulling that that pistol out of my belt. And it's also micro-cueing, I think, is is what I'd, I'd have to define it as. After you start doing things for a long time, you develop this, what we call spidey sense, right? You hear the inflection of the person on the radio. You see the, and these are micro cues. You don't even consciously know that they're there, but subconsciously your brain is already building a profile of what's going to happen, what you're going to do and what you need. And so, you know, once in a while you go, geez, I'm going to, I don't know why, but I'm going to throw this in my pack. 
because for whatever reason, you've caught that micro cue, mm-hmm. or that social cue that, that this might be a possibility. And so same thing with probably with doctors, as you start doing that, that interview with the patient, you begin to get some, some social cueing and micro cueing about what the real problem is, their true level of pain, the true mechanism of injury, that sort of thing. Yeah. And you can also, like you said, you learn to pick up the variability in the people around you, right? So when that radio call comes in and it's a paramedic and they're telling you either in words or not even using words, hey, something's wrong with this person. You know, you can get that, right? You understand what's coming down the pipe for you. Go back and watch reruns of Squad 51 of Emergency. And, and, you know, here's Dixie on 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 the radio telephone at that time. Rampart General, can I help you? Well, we've got a 51 year old male presenting blah, blah, blah. There's not, they're monotone. There's not a, a piece of inflection in there at all. And then you listen to my guys on the radio and, oh my God, it's like, slow down, stop yelling into the microphone. I don't care what age this guy is. You found him. We knew who was missing. You don't have to tell me who this is. All I know is I've got a subject that's presenting X, what you need from me, you know? Yeah. It, it, yeah, it just. I love it, man. The radio tends to flummox people. It's one of the yeah. things, that, you know, they they love knots and ropes. They they love navigation and, and all that sort of thing. But for some reason, when you put a microphone in someone's hand, their brain stops. You know, they lose those four brain cells that were holding things together. Everything goes out the window once, yeah. they, once I say, you, transmit. Be like, no, I'd, I'd much rather deal with this sucking chest wound without gloves or PPE, please. You know, why? Because I don't like the radio. It's yeah. the most powerful tool we have. Let's press on that, right? Like, why do you think that is? I mean, I I, I yeah. wonder if it's, is it that we have, you know, all of us have some sort of level of trouble communicating that requires a different, like part of our brain to be operational then, and it's harder to make automatic, right? Because you really have to think about it. And even if you're not on a radio, like we do this when we're, you know, I work with my, with my uh, resident doctors on this when we're mid trauma and we need to summarize for the room what our mental model is for what's happening. It's a parallel problem set to broadcasting on radio because you have to have form structure. You have to calmly and coherently transmit information to a group, make sure there's no mistakes and that everybody's sort of on the next page and reprioritize for what's next. But it's a challenge skill set for sure. I think you're right. It's communication relies so heavily on body language, eye contact, parallel, where people are talking about the same thing. And now you're in a serial communication mode where you're going to talk, you're not going to get any feedback until that other person talks to you. And it's, you know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Well, yeah, I can hear you. Well, how do I know you can hear me? Well, just push the button on the microphone. You know, I think that it's an unusual way of communication for people. And checklists help with this quite a bit. You know, a nine line for evacuation, that sort of thing helps all to at least format the uh, structure of the report, but it doesn't solve the adrenaline rush or the uh, lack of use of that radio for communication, because how often do you use it? It's the one thing you use only during that mission, you know, mm. unless you've got kids and you play walkie talkie with them. It's that it's a novel issue and a novel way to communicate really for humans. I think we're better off texting than we are doing that. You know, we talk a lot on the throughout the project about so-called halo techniques, right? Things that are high acuity, low occurrence. And mm-hmm. and these are things that don't come up that often, but they're absolutely critical, bordering sometimes on must not fail when they do happen. And a lot of the times when we talk about it from a medical point of view, we're talking about like, say, doing a surgical front and neck access or a crike or something, or decompressing a chest, something like that. But it's interesting because you're almost describing comms as a halo technique in this case, right? You're saying you only do it when the pressure's on. It's a must not miss. It is almost by definition, high acuity, low occurrence. I I don't think I've ever thought of that that way. Yeah. Because you're out there looking for that person and you've taken a lot of time to cut the peaks off of where you were. You've got your gear, you got your training, you know where you're at, you got the right map, you've been navigating really well, you hit your last four compass points, you've got good team members that you know around you, and then you find that person. And all of a sudden, everything ramps up from there because you go into another zero notice, although you were expecting to find that person. Now you found them, but their condition is unknown. Mm -hmm. And so we go into that basic patient assessment and then the advanced assessment. And then we want to be able to not only communicate that, but now we're starting to communicate, I need other resources. I'm going to need more people for the haul out. We don't have a Stokes. I need that. Maybe a helicopter is appropriate. We'll tell you in just a minute because... 
whether we load and go or we package and stay, haven't quite made that decision yet because I'm still 15 seconds into this. You know, we're still trying to maybe even figure out if we can stabilize the person. And so, yeah, so you get this whole other uh, big peak of performance pressure that you need to hit right there. And you're trying to tell people where you are. So if you haven't been keeping track with your thumb on your map or where you were for a while, now you've got to like point at someone and say, give me our coordinates. And so I think that what a lot of people don't do well there is delegate in that position. Because if you are trying to do the radio, do the assessment, figure out where you're at. I think that uh, delegation in that team is setting that up in the beginning works a long ways towards uh, making sure that when you guys hit something that uh, you perform better. Are you describing, again, we're, we're going back to this Yerkes dodson model, right? Where we're saying, we're we've essentially named two pieces of it. We named the zero notice where you're a little bit flat and you have to right shift yourself into optimal. And then right. we named the other side of that, which is that something happens, you know, you have that enormous neurotransmitters, like, you know, we're all humans, we're designed to track things and hunt things, right? So like you hit this thing where you find something, oh, bam, all these neurotransmitters go off and now you're going crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, you also now have to left shift yourself probably to cut some of that pressure to stay optimal. These are multiple skill sets that have to be deployed you know, all the time here. To buffer that, when you're talking about delegating, okay, I guess I have two questions. One, what rituals do you have in place when you hit those moments? What have you preloaded that are your tools to get yourself to optimal? And then two, when you're talking about using that as part of a team, delegating and stuff like that, are you setting that up ahead of time before you get on the trail? Or is that something that you have a standard operating procedure when you reach the person, you know, operator one goes left, operator two goes right? Let's start with that part first. Mm -hmm. So a pre-designation as a team leader, you got three or four or five people working with you. I think that the proper way to do it is to designate it in advance. And that's also by knowing your team. Who here is comfortable with Map and Compass today? Who's here has been here before that knows the park? Okay. You're my map and compass person. You have to know what our grid coordinates are all the damn time. That's your whole job, making sure we get from here to there and doing that. Who's my most medically certified person here? And are they a brand new EMT or have they been an EMT for 20 years? Who's most comfortable in, if we find someone, you're going to be the one to assess the patient and tell me if we need to load and go or if we're going to pack and stay? You know, who's going to be in charge of that patient's care? Because I'm the team leader. I got to coordinate. I can't get involved and get my hands messy with anything other than that radio and telling people what I need and where I need it and when I need it. So you should do that in advance, obviously. Sometimes it doesn't happen because, you know, you're pretty out of place. You've got people spread out over 100 yards or so. And your navigation guy finds the victim and starts the, the assessment. And so now you got to switch things a little bit until your true medical person gets there and can start taking care of the, the training, the, uh, the assessment and the, the patient care. So you want to do that first, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think the way to support it is, again, through checklists and through training. Every time we do something training-wise, we always, in the military, you know, you always knock off the number one guy to test the number two guy, right? To see how well the number one guy actually transmitted and communicated and trust and trained. Sure. So uh, we kind of do the same thing. Whenever we train, uh, we always injure a team member. Because if you don't, if you've got 20 people out there and only four of them are going to find the missing person, well, the other 15 need something to do. So we're going to injure one person on each of their teams and they're going to have to deal with that, right? Because that's also a zero onset and a, and a reality. You have to think about that. Geez, you know, okay, your ankle's twisted. Well, what are we going to do? Should the three of us keep going? Are you going to be okay limping back? Could this get worse? You know, you have to go through that whole assessment of, mm -hmm. of mission over care of, of that person. Yeah, there's so much in that. that we're always asking folks who are junior residents or coming up through the ranks, even you know medical students when we're talking back and forth to them, what would you do if the rest of us were in a different trauma? How would you manage yeah. this if we weren't here? Right. And yes. sort of exposing that thought process and that challenge back as a, you know, a mental simulator in some sense, or or even a, right. a real simulator about, okay, well, what happens if you sort of take the next step all of a sudden? What's that going to look like? That's the what would Dan do test, right? 
Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. The, what would you do better than what Dan would do test? But yeah. Right. Totally. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, what do you skills do you have to, to bear? And, you know, everyone brings something different, whether they're an attorney or whatever their skill set is, because that's what we bring to this. The volunteers are all from different backgrounds. So it's not like I've got everyone in the ER and I've got a trauma surgeon and then I've got an anesthesiologist and I've got whatever else I need, a, an eye guy and a hand guy. Like I said, I've got a Safeway butcher. I've got a lawyer. I've got a um, stay-at-home remote worker from IT and there's me. So yeah. what, are, what are the four of us going to bring to this other than our training, because we don't do this day to day. We don't have, again, you got to, you got to work hard to pick up those micro cues and social cues of what you're going to do and get used to it. You can do a, a patient assessment blindfolded pretty well. Your yeah, trauma nurse, train that blindfolded. Yeah. The, your, your trauma nurse, she knows the, she knows the 16 lead. She knows where everything goes. She can do it in the dark and the and same way with us. We can do navigation, stuff like that dark, but there are many things that are, are really low training uh, issues that you have to work on. But, you know, maybe this is a good time to bump up a level and move away a little bit from the individual level and into the team structural level, mm -hmm. right? Because we're starting to talk about how do we designate and delegate responsibility? How do we work together? One of the distinctions we draw both within the Emergency Mind Project and the Mission Critical Team Institute, switching hats for a second, is we talk about the difference between intact teams and swarm teams, right? Intact teams being like a baseball team. You, you all train together, you come up together, you work together. Swarm teams being, hey, I don't know, you know, here are the six people that we have. Maybe I know a little bit about their roles and skill sets, but we've never operated on a problem set together. When you're out for a search and rescue mission, it's striking me that it's a lot more like a swarm team. Am, am I reading Correct. that right? Okay. Yeah. And maybe you've met some of these folks in training or something, but you've probably never done that kind of an, an operation before. Probably. And training is 99% of what we do. You know, missing persons, depending upon your team, and we'll talk about San Bernardino County, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's such a large county. They've got 22 teams, something over 2,500 team members. They've got the rim of the world guys that do high angle work on San Gregonio, and they've got the Barstow Desert Rescue Squad that does nothing but ATV work in the in the desert, not much in the way of high angle. So you have all sorts of different skill sets, and all sorts of different people. And, and yeah, you may know them, but the training is where we get 99% of our experience. You don't get it on the search because there are teams that may get five, 10 searches a year. There may be teams that get a hundred searches a year. It just depends upon your population density, your environment, you know, how many tourists come to you. Yosemite, they get a lot of searches year round, right? Mm -hmm because of foreign nationals coming over and things like that and tourists. But you go to Barstow and the Desert Rescue Squad, they probably get about a dozen a year because not many people want to go wandering out in the desert there. There's nothing to see. But Death Valley is very different. You know, sure. Death Valley is a desert. You get a lot of people that wander out in the desert there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it depends on your environment very much so. But training is where you get all this. And that's where you you have to train with those folks. You have to meet them and greet them. But it is very much a swarm issue. And we have a high turnover in search and rescue. The average lifespan of someone is about two years, and it takes them about six months to a year to get trained and certified. So we've only got their heart and mind for another year to get them actually uh, experienced. At some point, they decide if this is a lifestyle or not, because it's not a hobby. And if you want that lifestyle, then you're going to commit to it. You're going to have a certain amount of time, a flexible job, things like that, that are going to make you eligible to, to do this long term. Some people, they find that it's too onerous. Life gets in the way. You don't have a lot of college students doing this. We don't have a lot of young parents doing it with new children. Sure. They take a sabbatical for a while when they have children. So you end up with typically middle-aged or over people that have a certain amount of, of flexibility in their lives. That two-year horizon that you're describing, that's sort of like when they're on call, when folks are on call and ready to be called up as part of a team. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Let's put ourselves in a hypothetical team and we can be, we can be, you know, I was hiking in Yosemite not too long ago, so we can be rescuing me in Yosemite if you want, or we okay. can be rescuing me wherever I am. Uh, sure. But you know, you get the call and, and Dan has done something foolish or, or just suffered an unfortunate accident, even if I was being careful. We'll call it bad luck. Right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that, man. We'll call it, we'll call it bad luck and maybe- I'd Environmental bad luck. Exactly. Yeah. Not, not Dan indicated, but we're Dan- uh, caused, but you're more generous than a lot of my guests. I appreciate that. 
anyway, so I'm I'm stuck at the bottom of something. And so, you know, you're calling up your team to come do this. And one of the problem sets that we face all the time is, you know, so everybody's coming from zero notice, everybody's assembling on a start point, and then you're all moving forward towards the objective. What's that first start point look like? How do you settle the swarm and move forward in that first couple of moments? What are the rituals that you use to turn everybody's minds the same and to and to get the team together? Yeah. So I think that the actual very first part of that queuing is with the call out. Mm-hmm. So the initiation of the team. So you've got somebody that is very calm on the recording because we have a system that calls people out and does a recording, right? So you give them all the information, the facts, you do a Walter Cronkite with them about this is where it is. You know, this is what we think has occurred. We're heading off to Cathedral Spire. And Dan was uh, up there, but the weather turned and now he's stuck. Can't get up, can't get down. So we're going to need, you know, all the high angle people and a couple of medical people, but I don't need the hiking people. So you've already set an expectation of what skill sets you want to bring on board, what the type of mission is going to be versus, hey, you know, Dan's got Alzheimer's. He's wandering around in the valley and we're not mm-hmm. sure if he's in someone else's tent cabin or, you know, if he's just wandering around the road somewhere or he's in the Merced River. So we start with that. And then once we get everybody at the command post, it's a very serial slash parallel operation. We don't wait for everyone to get there before we brief. As people come in, we begin to brief them individually. And as we get three or four appropriate people in that swarm, off they go on an assignment. We have assignments already going. Our command post folks are, are looking at the probability of different areas of where that person may be. So we have assignments for canines and, and humans, et cetera. And so as those four people get there, we do a quick brief and off they go. And that second part is where the briefing, the intel and plans people come into place in the incident command system. You want that briefer to be calm, to be uh, very experienced and be able to read the team. So they they look at the four of us that are about to come and look for you and he goes, oh, geez, these are four new people. This is not a really good team. So maybe this isn't the right assignment for them. Or maybe I hold them until some more experienced people come. Mm-hmm. So part of that is the balance of the team. The other part is the expectation. You know, here we are. You're going out looking for this person. We're only a radio call away. We have a, a medical pre-stage medical support team ready to go. The minute you call and you find this person, we've got all of our gear here. We've got a tech rescue group with the winch and everything. So if you call, we, we're right there. You just give us your coordinates. We'll be Johnny on the spot for you. So you start to build their confidence that the system is there to support them appropriately. Wow. So I'm I'm immediately struck by what you're describing in terms of one of the adages of mass casualty in the ER is always you have one of your most experienced providers leave their assignment and go up to the front. Right, yeah. because they need to do the sorting and the triage function. Triage, right, exactly. Because there are intangibles that are hard to describe when you both when yep. you're looking at teams and when you're looking at victims, and it's hard to to teach those intangibles to folks necessarily. But if you've been in the dirt enough, you understand how oh, that guy's real sick. He's got to go here. This one, oh, okay, yeah. they can probably wait a little bit. You're not perfect at that, but those intangibles are are a very real thing. What are the subtleties? Yeah. Exactly. And we are we haven't even talked about urban search and rescue about, you know, that sort of mass casualty searching uh, where you have kinetic injuries and that sort of thing. This is just a missing person who's got maybe head trauma, back trauma, uh, maybe just a bent ankle. Maybe they're just lost or dehydrated or maybe they're just lost, confused. Maybe it's not a medical issue. Maybe they screwed up on their map and compass work. Or maybe they're intentional. Maybe they're suicidal or mm-hmm. they uh, they want to get away. They're just a missing person and the family wants to find them, but they really are a little upset and they don't want to be found by the family. A lot yeah. of variables you, go you, in there. All the folks sure. coming to you usually want to be treated. Not all the folks that we look for want to be found. <laughs> totally fair. Totally fair. Yeah, very, very different, very different environments, but very parallel sort yeah. of processing in terms of like what we're doing and how we're how we're operationalizing right. that. Um, it's interesting to me that that you're describing a, a model where people come together, swarm, get an assignment, and then go out, and you're still moving resources dynamically through that pipeline until the problem set gets solved, right? Exactly. We, we tend to have more of a, okay, you get the one, you know, in a, in a small hospital or even in a big hospital, honestly, you get one code team, right? If you're lucky, there's a plan on paper for a second code team that has to respond somewhere else, but that might not exist, right? Assuming no one called it a sick, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, you know, so you go and you're off doing it and then that's it. Like you get your one person with you and you're going to, to tackle the problem set. But it's interesting that dynamic, continual application of resources to problems like that. So if you look at that throughput and that team level organization and answer this either as the incident commander or as the leader of one of those small group teams on an assignment, and you look at how you do that now, how you would do that now, what's different between you now and a younger version of Chris that was just starting out in this game? Wow. So um, the difference is probably patience and experience, knowledge. Earlier, Chris would be the first one there probably broke the speed limit, but not any other traffic laws to get there, right? Very young Chris probably would have been uh, trying to rush through the system. Hurry up, get me a radio. Hurry up, you know, get me briefed. Where are the next three people? Why do I have to wait for them? They can catch up with me on the, on the, on the thing. Earlier, Chris had no risk assessment capability or risk management capability. He lived off adrenaline probably. And I think we find that in a lot of our our earlier search and rescue people in their career. And then at some point, Chris developed a lot more knowledge and a little bit more experience. And he realized that this is going to get done, whether it's Chris or whether it's someone else. And you can't rush the system like you can't rush the Marine Corps. You know, it, there's the system can only get so many people through it. And if I'm the one that finds the person, great. I'll wait for the other three team members before we go out. It makes sense because... Being alone, all I've done is become part of the problem, not part of the solution. And so I learned that what it takes to be part of the solution as a group. And then as Chris got more experience to add to that more education, he realized that there are a lot of very small things that make a difference in experience. And now I can make the system work better and safer about you know, did you do a radio check? I never used to ask that with teams when I was briefing them, you know, here's your radios, let's go. And then, nope, while I'm briefing you guys, turn on your radios right here. Make sure you all hear everybody, call into the dispatch area, see if you can hear them, because I don't want you to find this out 500 yards down the trail and have to come back. You know, you start to learn the little professional shortcuts and habits that you need. And they slow things down, but slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And that's the part that, Beginner Chris didn't understand. He wanted to move faster than the system allowed him, and the system throttled him for a reason. Yeah, man. There's a lot <laughs> of. Uh, I try to have a lot of compassion for for younger Dan. Some of, yeah. <laughs> some of the choices that he made on some of this stuff, but but, but I, 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 I kick yeah. younger Chris's butt in my mind <laughs> continuously. It's like a, a lifelong twelve step program of apologizing all my earlier teammates and <laughs> folks that taught me and trained me and stuff about, about you were right. You were right. You were right. And I was wrong. And I apologize for that because, you know, I ran over you in my M60 patent tank when I wanted to, to get to where I wanted to go. Cause it was like, you know, that victim dr uh, drive and that a drill and drive to, to get there. And that only wears off as you get more wrinkles on your face, I think. I recently had the good fortune to be able to actually apologize to one of my teachers that I had, you know, he was my attending when I was a resident and we used to, wow. man, getting some, I was pretty damn surly at two or three in the morning when he was asking me to think about leadership problem sets, not just getting the patient done. Right. And I had the very good fortune of uh, getting a chance to talk to him and and wrote him an apology in, in the book as like a footnote, like, Hey, if you're reading this, you're, you're totally right, man. I was, I was, I was wrong. And I yeah. think there's a lot of a lot of art in that. But something I I struggle to teach and and struggle to continue to get better at is this idea of what you're describing of matching your pace to the natural rhythm of the system, right? Because if you're too slow or too fast, you're actually more inefficient than if you're able to hit yeah. that. I don't know the resonant frequency. I'm not sure what the word for that is. Yeah, I, operational rhythm. I think. Yeah. And yeah. maybe it's a, maybe it's an op tempo kind of thing, but, yeah. but operational rhythm is a good way to put it. Cause it, it, there's like, there's a part of it that's you and a part of it's that everything else around you. One of the examples that I was just working with one of my uh, residents about the other day is feeling the pauses in the system around you, right. As opposed to just going full speed at everything. So you're running a trauma, right. There's typically a, 
a lull moment. You've done your primary survey, you've done most of the secondary survey, maybe you've done an ultrasound, but your, your nursing staff is securing IVs, you haven't rolled the patient yet, there's like a couple of things that have to happen next, but they can't happen yet. Because right. the IVs aren't in and the person's not totally exposed. And like, and you have to, it's very tempting at the beginning to just be nothing but frustrated at that moment and just push, 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 push. But to feel yeah. the calmness and ebb and be like, all right, here's my chance to summarize. Here's my chance to regroup with the team. That's a real difference that I see between the folks that are that are higher along in their training and and at least me when I started. How do you teach that? Right? You know, I think that um older Chris in retrospect. Now, I call it the spring butt, right? You get someone that says, I want to join your team. And the next thing you know, they're at everything. They haven't missed a thing. They're at every training. They're at every meeting. They're volunteering to do stuff. They're at every work party. And you go, this person needs something else in their life. They need life balance with this. But this is going to be a spring butt. This person is going to be the first one everywhere. And they're going to be driven hard. And so I think that you need to start to throttle that person. And it probably... For me, our team had a three-month waiting period. You applied, you could go to trainings, but you really weren't on the team for the first three months. It felt like hazing, like like they were testing me to make sure I was really interested, right? No, they were trying to throttle me back a little bit and and assess me as to, you know, are they going to have to help me understand that I need to slow down or am I just not slow downable enough? You know, if they can't throttle me, then I'm probably not a good team member because I think that those rogue elements are romanticized quite a bit. You look at a lot of TV shows, right? It's the guy that breaks the rules. It's, you know, mm-hmm. the prime directives there except for everyone but but Captain Kirk, right? So he's the hero because he breaks the rules. Well, that's okay when you're the one breaking the rules because you see the ends justify the means, you think, and, and um, you do it. But the system is built to eliminate those people to minimize them because the system has to work. If you are all rogues, the system doesn't work and you never get to do the pause. You never get that, that moment. And so I I think that the system has to be reinforced with people. Hmm. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I think that, uh, that that's what you need to do. I think this is maybe the first time in the, in the podcast that we're really calling out patients as an elite performance skill. Patience and tolerance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And tolerance of patience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah, patience temple. is yeah. you gotta you you gotta wait. <laughs> you, you know, as a cop, sometimes you gotta learn to wait. You're talking to someone and you're trying to develop this and your partner says, well, let's just hook this guy. I'm like, no, nah, wait a minute. Let's let's talk to them further. Let's see what else we can get out of this to see where it's going. Patience is extraordinarily important because not everything presents at first, right? Sometimes you got to get through that first set of symptoms to get to the deeper ones. That secondary assessment only occurs with patients. Chris, this has been amazing, man. I thank you so much for this. There, there's no, so you, much Jack. learning in like, in like the, you know, ramping up and thinking about patients and tempo and understanding what the mindset of search and rescue is. As we're drawn to a close on this, I want to give you a chance if you feel interested in challenging everybody listening to this. Right, folks that are listening, whatever their background and skill set is, what's something you want them to try differently in this coming week? What do you want to challenge them to do? So let's challenge them to that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Instead of going into it with your warp engines on, let's slow down a little bit and allow that micro cueing and that assessment to sink in and to really tell you what's going on. Amazing. Chris, thank you so much, man. Dan, thank you. Love the podcast, man. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. And you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right. Good luck out there.